going to be talking about um, the impacts of changes on libraries. Um, I'm Susan Tegg, I'm the convener of the ICT group. Um, Alison Hunter and I, who's the convener of the um, IRA group, and I have pulled together a, a seminar and workshop that we believe will be interesting and challenging. Um, the usual housekeeping things, if people could turn their mobiles onto silent, you could even turn it off, but hey, you won't ask too much. Um, the toilets are down the corridor out here, and if the fire alarm goes off, uh, the exit is those main stairs that you came up or would have seen when you came in, so they've got fire doors, etc. So I'll just tell you a little bit about today. Um, we've divided the day into two halves. The morning is a seminar format with a series of talks and in the afternoon we're going to have more of a workshop approach. The workshop will be challenging because there's a lot of people here but um, we hope you'll participate in, you know, as best we can with this number. Uh, we didn't want to turn people away so we've taken a few more people than um, it was probably ideal. Um, so we really want the workshop to, to hear people's views and to you know, tease out some of the detail around discovery layers and, and what's going on in the IT world. Uh, every year the ICT group um, looks at the Horizon reports which predicts um, what ICT is going to roll through the education sector. Uh, they look at short term and long term and we've brought together some speakers this morning who are going to address some of the topics that the Horizon Report talks about. So specifically we've got um, e-books, which e textbooks and gaming, those together, digital curation and remote hosting. Um, <coughs> in the afternoon we're going to ask you, as I said, to do a bit more work. Helen Livingston from the University of South Australia will kick off the afternoon challenging us to look at um, the changes that discovery layers are bringing to us, both to our work and to the patron experience. And we're then going to ask you to work in smaller groups to discuss those impacts and raise discussion points. Um, we're not pretending that we have all the answers, of course, but we think there's plenty to talk about with that. Um, and, uh, and, of course, then we also want you to mix and mingle with colleagues from other um, places and do all that. And we're also lucky to have three library students here, so if you happen to run into them, please make them welcome. Uh, before we start, we're going to start with the old uh, chestnut communication. Uh, Cameron Barnes is going to talk about communication, specifically looking at uh, the communication between librarians and IT um, people. Um, hopefully we'll come away with a few strategies or at least a better understanding of where things go wrong. Um, Cameron has worked at uh, UNE as a web coordinator uh, in various roles really, but is currently web coordinator for a long time. We appreciate him coming down. He's a valuable member of the ICT group. We really appreciate his views. Mainly we teleconference with him so we don't get to meet him very often. Um, and like most of the people in the ICT group, and I guess a lot of you too, his job straddles both um, IT and the library worlds and, and that's not always an easy thing to do. Um, so, just to get on with the day, I'd like to thank Cameron and get him to come up here, please, and start the talk, start the day. Um, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. The cheque is in the mail. Now, before I start, I would like to ask people two questions. And the first and the most important one is how many people are familiar with Harry Potter? Anyone not familiar with Harry Potter? I'm sorry, could you leave? <laughs> okay, I, I will try and keep the references to Harry Potter to a minimum. Second question, how many people work in organisations that are co-located or under the same um, organisational umbrella as, IT, as their IT unit, whether it's council? Excellent. You can go to sleep now. <laughs> Marvellous. You already know what I'm going to say. Um, when I first mooted this um, idea of a talk, it is building on a talk that I attended many years ago about the same topic, dealing with IT people. And I want to go over some of the ground of that talk. And I also want to look at the strategies that we can employ to ensure that IT and us are on the same, wa same wavelength, which is not always easy. I just... 
Okay. Is that your idea of the IT people in your organisation? You're laughing. Well, most people would agree that the average IT unit at their organisation or somewhere is not quite as dysfunctional as the IT crowd. But people who watch the IT crowd often remark how true to life it is in certain respects. Has anyone watched The Librarians? Excellent. How realistic is the portrayal of librarians in that program? <laughs> the point is that stereotypes determine a lot of our day-to-day -day response to um, people outside our organisation. Now, the topic is um, communication with IT, and I'm focusing... Bloody IT people, I don't know. Can't set anything up. Okay, most libraries deal with IT staff from outside their organisation. This is the case even when you are co-located with an IT unit or an IT unit is within the, the same organisational umbrella. Many libraries are using cloud services. Hands up anyone who's confused when I use the term cloud service. Excellent. There'll be a short multiple choice exam at the end of this talk. You must get 110%. <laughs> okay. Most of us use cloud services now. They include discovery layers like Summon, and they include add-ons to your web catalogue like Syndetic Solutions. How many people here use Syndetic Solutions? Excellent. How many people use a discovery layer? Wonderful. Never heard of Google Scholar, have you? Hmm. <laughs> Now, a later speaker is going to talk about cloud computing, I believe, in a little more detail, but I want to just talk about the benefits of the cloud. First of all, it lets libraries focus on clients rather than on technology. And that's a big claim, but I think ultimately you'll have to agree that that's the, the main value of cloud computing. It offers economies of scale improved reliability, lower costs, and greater bandwidth. Now, these are promises, whether they are all, always realised or not is another question. Reduces the upfront cost of moving to new systems. And that's an important benefit for the cloud because essentially, instead of building a new system, you rent a new system. And finally, allows libraries to innovate without increasing demands on institutional IT. And that means that you can um, adopt a new um, platform in the cloud and the IT people in your organisation don't fall over screaming, oh my God, where am I going to get that service space? Not every joke can be a winner, OK. <laughs> I write all my own material, as you've probably noticed. Libraries have barely begun to make use of the cloud. Most academic libraries host their library uh, management system on campus. Many will shift their library management system to cloud over the next two to three years. And in fact, one of the major um, upcoming um, library management systems, Alma, is only available as a cloud service. In fact, anyone here from Unilink? Excellent. Well done. Unilink is... The Unilink institutions are probably the major exception to the rule that academic libraries, libraries from my field, um, prefer to host their library management system on campus. My guess, based on a survey I was dragooned into doing over the last few weeks, was that within the next two to three years, probably almost half the academic libraries in Australia will move to the cloud for their um, LMS. And so that's a, a really big change. Okay. Barriers to communication. 
let's put aside cliches about Indian call centres. Let's not worry about um, time zones and global English. And when I talk about global English, I'm talking about Americans as well as um, Indians. I rung up America and said, I've come from Armadale, and they've heard me and said, from where? <laughs> More important are differences in organisational culture. And critical issues arise where shared expectations are lacking. And these, I would argue, are the most significant barriers to effective communication. So what I'm going to say here is the problem we have with IT, and I'm assuming we've all had problems with IT, come down to differences in organisational culture and a lack of shared expectations about service. And I would argue that these are fundamentally more important than the problem of, um, say, lack of a shared um, technical vocabulary, um, differences in um, the variety of English we have, and differences in time, that, that old tyranny of distance which we Australians are supposed to suffer from. Now, this is not the problem. Can everyone see that? Just because I don't care doesn't mean I don't understand. How many times have we thumped the desk and said, those fools at IT, they don't understand? And Sandra will remember um, a staff member at um, Dixon Library who would often say, they don't understand how to run a library. So I'm going to do a Myers-Briggs exercise. How many people have done a training exercise in which they are asked to do the Myers-Briggs? Excellent. There is absolutely no validity in the Myers-Briggs exercise whatsoever. <laughs> it's been discredited time and time again, and despite that, it's very, very effective. So I'm going to try and put you into the IT headspace for a moment. Don't be afraid. You're going from Dumbledore's army to the Death Eaters. Isn't that Voldemort really cool? Yeah. OK, what does an IT person want? He seeks change. I'm going to argue that libraries prefer stability. I'm going to argue that IT tolerates uncertainty. Libraries prefer certainty. And this is a difficult one. IT people are realists and library people are perfectionists, and I'm going to come back to that in a few seconds. IT people are risk-taking, and library people are risk-adverse. And IT people favour hard skills over soft skills. Now, am I bugging anyone yet? Oh, damn. Let's look at the difference. Realism to perfectionism. Is perfectionism a virtue? OK, you're all rocket scientists. You're developing a spacecraft that's going to put a man on the moon or a woman on the moon. We're going to dump them in the Pacific Ocean dead. Is perfectionism a virtue? Quite clearly. I would argue that librarians have made perfectionism an important part of their life because it is essential if we don't have accurate metadata, if we don't keep our call numbers correct, if we don't keep everything in absolute order, then we have chaos. People can't find things. Now, when I call an IT person a realist, what do you think I mean? Are they more realistic? Are they more real world? No, generally IT people look in terms of, ah, that's version 1.0, we can fix it later. Or, don't worry, we'll fix it in the documentation. Every IT person has read about user-centred design. Every um, IT person knows exactly what they're doing wrong when they rush the product out the door. That's why they're realists, because they say, I can't do this right, but I have to do it. So I'm going to do it now. Now, 90% of our problems with IT 
boil down to this. An IT person puts out a product and says it works 99 times out of 100. Okay. They say that's fantastic. 1% error rate. And the librarian says 1% error rate? Do you mean once every 100 searches it will go wrong? So the librarian is half empty and the IT person sees the glass is half full. Now I'm going to go out on a limb for a moment. How many people use a discovery layer? How many people are happy with their discovery layer? Excellent. <laughs> Have those two people shot. <laughs> the reason is not that your discovery layer is a terrible product. In fact, many of your students probably swear blue and blind, uh, black and blue, whatever, um, that it is an excellent product. It, the reason is that librarians expect something to work reliably and efficiently every time. Students, of course, don't have that expectation, and IT people know very clearly that no system is perfect, at least until version 5.0172Z. So when we're dealing with IT people, it's important to keep that distinction in mind. They do care, but they don't care in this quite the same way. Now let's look at some cultural differences again, and I'm being um, deliberately provocative. First of all, IT people are hierarchical. Libraries are open. Tell me, how many people come from an open, non-hierarchical library? <laughs> That's what I thought. Okay, IT people are increasingly project-oriented. Library people are service-oriented. Now, that's not true anymore, at least in my library. Increasingly, we are becoming project-oriented, and that's changing the way we approach things. I'm going to say that IT people are technology-centric, and library people are people-centric. Now, some people are smiling there, and I don't know whether that's because they're happy with the idea and saying, yes, we are people-centric. Or, in fact, they're going, you are a crazy kid. <laughs> in fact, one of the greatest shocks of my entire life was that a previous boss said to me, librarians are people, people. And I looked at her and I thought for a moment, damn, I should have taken the pills this morning. <laughs> because this, this is a perception that librarians have of themselves that is not shared by anyone else on the planet. <laughs> And finally, I want to say that IT people are masculine and libraries are feminine. Now, before I'm stormed <laughs> off the, um, the floor and tarred and feathered, look around. Most of you are women. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> I'm very fond of women myself. But let us remember that women and men are different. Um, please feel free to say vive la différence. But you will find that IT people do tend to have a, a masculine, shall I say, thrust. Um, they tend um, to have all the vices of the male um, gender. They have some virtues. Whereas librarians are, in fact, more likely to value... Um, any IT people in the audience, by the way? <laughs> you, you, excellent. Would you leave for the next two minutes? Now, I would argue that librarians are less defensive. I would argue that they're um, perhaps slightly more touchy-feely than IT people. And... Um, I think I'll leave that to the discussion later. But I think it's very important to remember that there are cultural differences and they are significant and they become particularly significant when we're talking about the dreaded uh, customer relations system. 
Okay, most IT units employ a customer relations management system. How many people have a familiarity with such a system? Oh, most of you are very, very lucky. A CRMS exists to mediate communication with clients and the CRMS is usually the preferred channel of contact between IT and its clients. It can either be a barrier or an adjunct to effective communication. Now, a CRMS is basically a glorified framework for belligerent emails. You send a, a request, it gets ignored. You send another request, and then finally everything breaks down into tears at the, at the bar or over the coffee shop. No, seriously, a CRMS is designed to help IT people manage their relations with their clients, and it's designed to ensure that they give all clients the best possible service. It just doesn't seem that way. Oops. I'm sorry, I, my wife brought me a, um, an iPad and um, I'm starting to get touchy. <laughs> Your CRMS is absolutely vital tool. You need to learn how the system works and you need to discover how to flag urgent jobs and direct queries to the right person. Before you send a request using your CRMS, do your homework. Make sure you understand the exact dimensions of an issue. Don't say X doesn't work. Explain the context. X doesn't work with IE 8.0 on platform whatever. I can't emphasise this too much. Very often people will ring us in the library service desk and says this doesn't work. Well, the internet doesn't work. Well, actually the internet is working. Um, we click on our browsers and we go somewhere and we have no trouble going to wherever we have to go and we have to get back to the person and find out under what circumstances does this not work. People seem to have a lot of magical thinking and that doesn't help when we're communicating with other more hardcore IT people. You need to do your homework. A service level agreement, an SLA. How many people have a service level agreement? Wonderful. All the rest, your time will come. A service level agreement specifies baseline services and outlines guaranteed levels of performance. The SLA determines what you can and cannot reasonably expect from your external vendor or your external IT. If you have a service level agreement, you need to know what it says. Now I'm going to be a bastard. How many people have read their service level agreement? They're very tentative there, but that's excellent. Those people who have read their service level agreement are in a much stronger position than those who haven't. Now, I'm just going to give you a little anecdote to emphasise the importance of a service level agreement. We ask for a bug fix from our IT department. And I rang up um, the person who was the white hat, and I'll go on about that later, and I said, um, what turnaround can we expect from problems? And they said, well, a, a turnaround was in 24 hours. I said, oh, so the problem will be fixed in 24 hours? No, you'll get an email saying we're working on the problem within 24 hours. <laughs> well, actually, you get an email immediately after you submit a job in the customer relations management system that just says, thanks for your um, inquiry, we're getting onto it. So in fact, they have met their service um, obligation the moment you submit your um, request. No further action is required, and um, if the problem is never resolved, that's actually not their fault. Now this is a, a slightly um, jaundiced view but the fact remains for our IT people, they don't actually give us a, a schedule of by when we should expect resolutions of problems, which is why our library is looking towards getting a service level agreement with them. No service level agreement? Make sure you know what standards apply.
What are reasonable time frames for different actions? When can you request improvements? Where necessary, refer to these standards and discussions. Now, by that, I mean don't stand up, get on your high horse, mix another metaphor, and say your service level agreement says that this should be resolved in five working days every time you put in a, a request. You need to, to husband your powder. And if there are no standards or no adherence to them, maybe you need a service level agreement. Now this is the most important slide of all. Many IT organisations have people whose task it is to ensure effective customer service. Some people actually have that title. Hi. You need to find out who these customer relations people are. You need to become familiar with the organisational hierarchy. You need to identify the key managers. Managers exist in a different world to frontline troops. Often they have a very funny idea of what is happening. Um, once I was told by someone, we provide every document delivery within um, a week. Needless to say, no one does that. No one can do that. So you need to build rapport with analysts and administrators who are receptive to a phone call or email when things go wrong. And these people are invaluable. So let me summarise my contradictory information, my contradictory advice. First of all, learn how to do things the right way. Use the customer relations management system to put in requests. And then learn how to subvert the system. Find people who are receptive to a phone call, who are receptive to an email, and will put things back on track when things go wrong. Um, anyone had a beer or a coffee with someone from their IT department? One person. Oh, good, excellent. Others, don't be afraid. You're among friends. It's really important to build a personal rapport with these people. Obviously, you can't go and have a beer with someone who's based in Singapore or Delhi. But, or, or Los Angeles. Though if you do, please, I, I speak American badly. Um, but you can, in fact, try and develop a relationship with these people, even if it's only by email. Most IT staff work under pressure. You are only one client. Their organisation's strategic goals are probably quite different to those of your library. You need to learn to make a good case when urgency is required. Don't say, oh yes, this will affect 2% of users. Explain that 2% of 17,000 external students is 340 people, and therefore this is going to affect hundreds of people. And remember that bad news can be more motivating than good news. Let's take an example. Okay, this is how many of your requests seem to them. IT people make tiny change to library catalogue. Remember, they're not um, perfectionists. They're glass half full people. The catalogue is working and you want to make a tiny change to it. How important is this? It's not. However, you might like to projectize a series of improvements or you might like to put this tiny change in perspective to help them understand that it will make a significant difference. Finally. <laughs> this is the real face of your IT. <laughs> that was badly timed. It worked on my machine. Um, I want you to imagine for a moment that Voldy disappears finally, and that's the real face of your IT person. Someone helpful and friendly, not evil. 
I think that's the most important thing you can take away from this little talk is that IT people are people too and you just have to get on their wavelengths and I think I'd better kill that before I go crazy. <laughs> so thank you for being a wonderful audience. Thank you for laughing, well, most of the time. My email is there. Send me an email if you did or didn't like this presentation. So thank you very much. <laughs>